uh, Professor, thank you very much. Very nice to be with a fellow recovering New Yorker. Good to be with you. Um, and to everybody in the audience today, welcome. As a show of hands, who has been with us before for one of our conversations here in the past? So we have done two conversations previously. This was imagined to be a series of three events. The first was with Marvin Odom, the former global chairman of Shell Oil, who left that company to become the chief recovery officer for the city of Houston following Hurricane Harvey. Then a couple of months ago, we had uh, John Mackey uh, of Whole Foods here, who I will tell you was a delight. I'm glad that the McComb School was able to find the one picture of John Mackey smiling during that conversation <laughs> to put up on the screen here. Most of the time, he looked like he wanted to kill me. Um, <laughs> and today, we're finishing with a bang. I'll introduce our wonderful guests and, and welcome them. Uh, uh, we're, we're so happy to be in partnership with the McComb School on a series of events at the intersection of business and policy. In his absence, I want to thank our dean, Jay Hartzell of the McComb School, who has been such a great partner and good friend. Gail Height and everybody at the McComb School for being such good hosts. Please give everybody here a big hand. Thank them for hosting us. You may know that the Tribune, as the professor said, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan digital news organization. We do about 50 events a year around the state, all of them except for the Big Texas Tribune Festival for free. So you are here for free. We're happy to provide you not only access to this event, but also lunch. But somebody pays the bill. And in the case of, of the Tribune's events around the state, sponsors make it possible for us to do these convenings. And I want to acknowledge Pearson and the Texas Conference for Women, in addition to the McComb School, thank them for their generous support, as well as uh, any of you in the audience who are members of the Texas Tribune. We've been at this now for almost 10 years. And we appreciate the support you've given us, either one time or over time, to make it possible for us to build from the ground up a journalism organization that does public interest work on behalf of all of Texas. We thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to do about 40 minutes of conversation from the stage. We'll take your questions for the balance of our time and be done at 1 o'clock. Let me ask you, please, to silence your phones if you've not done that already for the benefit of people in the room. We're also streaming this event, and we'd like to be sure that people get an opportunity to see it at home without phones going off. Um, if you want to tweet about this event, we certainly encourage that. The hashtag is TT. Events. Like I said, 40 minutes of conversation, 20 minutes of questions. Let me introduce our distinguished guests. We're so happy to have them join us here on stage. To my left is Melly Price. Melly is a serial software entrepreneur who co founded the business intelligence platform Softmatch and the startup accelerator Capital Factory, where she serves as director of diversity and inclusion. She's the inaugural executive director for commercialization at the Dell Medical School here at the University of Texas at Austin and was the founder and CEO of Frontgate Tickets, one of the largest privately held ticketing companies in the U.S. and Canada before its sale to Live Nation in 2015. She just told me, very relevant to being in this building, that she finished her master's in the MT MSTC. MSTC program here at the McComb School on Saturday. Give her a hand for that. <laughs> That's great. As, as if she has not climbed enough mountains in her long career, <laughs> there's another. <laughs> Melly is a native of Pennsylvania, and she is an undergraduate, uh, uh, has an undergraduate degree in addition to her uh, now master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin. My friend Eugene Sepulveda is CEO of the Entrepreneurs Foundation, a 20-year-old organization founded to help entrepreneurs and their teams build successful corporate cultures. He's also a director and partner in Capital Factory and the founder of Culturati, a community of CEOs, entrepreneurs, investors, and other C-suite leaders who practice and study culture building and share their playbooks. Eugene previously served as the CFO of an Austin semiconductor startup. Honestly, I could spend an hour on the things that Eugene has done over time. <laughs> yeah. I'll limit it to that, except to say he is also a former board member of the Texas Tribune and a longtime friend. He's a native of Houston. He has an undergraduate degree from Texas A&M University. Finally, Joe Spearman, founder and CEO of Localer, a community of locals in 100 plus cities around the world who share recommendations with travelers on where to eat, drink, and play. He is one of the few African-American founders to raise $5 million for a tech startup. He's named one of LinkedIn's top influencers for entrepreneurship for three years. He was also named a top 10 black innovator of 2014 by Movement 50 and an emerging business leader of the year by the Greater Austin Black Chamber. He is a native of Temple and a graduate of UT Austin. Please give our three distinguished guests a big <laughs> So. Hi, you three. I'm going to pretend we don't know each other personally. I'm, going to start, I'm just going to start right in and ask really hard and mean questions, because um, that worked so well with John Mackey. Um, <laughs> I, I, in, in thinking about this conversation and in trying to get a handle on exactly 
what question we're trying to answer today, or what problem we're trying to solve, I thought, go get some data and confirm the suspicion that we have a diversity problem in technology. Fact check true, we have a diversity problem in technology. W women represent just over 50%, Melly, of the US and Texas population, just under 50% of the US and Texas workforce, but only about 35% of the tech force nationally and only about 37% of the tech workforce in Texas. The US population is 61% Anglo, 18% Hispanic, 12% African American, 6% Asian. The tech workforce way under indexes Hispanic and African American, over indexes Asian and Anglo. In leadership of the tech industry, 84% of tech executives are white, 80% are men. We have a problem, right, Melly? I'd, I'd agree. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what do the numbers tell you? I mean, it's easy to just trot out a bunch of statistics, but there's obviously a long story behind that. What, what's going on here? What are we to take away from that? Well, some of the data specific to women that I find interesting is that when you interview um, exiting MBA candidates, uh, the majority of them, at least half of them, believe that they could aspire to leadership. And if you interview them two years later, that number drops below uh, 20%. It's usually about 16%. So they, d they doubt going in the door that leadership is for them, but they discover quite quickly when they get into tech, no, actually, I can do this. That's no, ab nice absolutely so the opposite. It's the inverse. Right, yeah. yeah, absolutely the opposite. You come out of grad school, you think the sky's the limit. Ideal. I go into right. my organization, you see how the sausage is made, and you, and you give up within the first couple of years. There's, a, I think, a misconception that it's about um, motherhood. And I think the fall off happens much earlier uh, and then is exacerbated around the time that a, a woman decides to have children. So I actually think we should hit this issue earlier on in the training and mentoring of young women. Um, and then the other thing is that the, the mentorship process itself, we typically look to very senior women to mentor the youngest. And some of the research shows that it's more effective for women that are, say, a rung or two next on the ladder to mentor the younger women because they actually have more relevant experience and more real-time experience to offer to get them through the cycle. So, um, you know, the, there's certainly issues around um, work, work-life balance and motherhood and um, career that are very real, but I actually think there's a huge opportunity earlier on to influence how we mentor young women and how we um, intentionally progress them through leadership. And I, I can't comment on that data relative to um, racial dem demographics, but that's certainly the case for women. Uh, Eugene, you and Melly and I are all of the same generation. Joan, Joe is a little bit younger than we are. Uh, I wonder if there's something about our generation versus the next generation that has made this problem persistent, and time will take care of it. What do you think? <clears throat> you know, time is taking care of it a little bit. Um, we see some of the small, you know, our, the newer startups. But, it, but, but it's, it's a pipeline issue. You know, I mean, last data that we have in 2018, when you look at the number of women or minorities graduating with computer science degrees or in other with STEM degrees, it's, it's, it's about half of the, that for Anglos. Yeah. For Anglo males. So... You know, I, I look at this, it's a bit systemic. You know, I say the government has 51% ownership of the problem, and, and tech has 30%, and, and we, whatever communities we're from, have about 20%. But the, gov the government having the problem, you mean that the education system is not preparing the next workforce well, adequately? Let's talk about 20, I mean, yeah, talk yeah. about Texas. Yeah. So in 2011, eighth graders in Texas were performing second best in the country. You had to break them down by demographic. Yep. White, eighth graders, and then black and brown, eighth graders. Second best in the country, only after Massachusetts. Texas cuts $5 billion out of its education budget. We've, re we've returned some of that money, but the math scores are still spiraling. Right. And you know who, who dropped the furthest is affluent white kids. You know, we are not educating we're not making the investment in this state that we need. You already had huge disparities, about 20%, 20 point disparities between right. minority kids and Anglo kids. So um, I see it as a pipeline. I mean, it's adding on to what Melly's saying, and we have some, some cultural issues and some expectation issues and some clubbishness issues. 
once you're in the workforce, yeah. but even being prepared to be hired, we're having to take on, and, and I hope we'll get to, yeah. to some stuff that, that Heather and WP Engine and others, mm-hmm. other of our friends are doing. Right. J- Joe, you, you come at this a little bit newer to the game. What is your perspective on why the industry is, is I mean, you're, you're a unicorn in many respects. <laughs> You've been celebrated for your success, but in some ways you're the exception mm-hmm. who proves the rule. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean... I think that technology is an industry where whether you are Apple computer or a small startup like Localer, the fundamental thing you have to do right is you have to nail your problem. You have, yeah. That means you have to define the problem first. Right. And I think the reason why diversity and inclusion is such a persistent issue in tech is because the industry at large has still not done a good job of defining the problem. I mean, we see some people think it's, you know, about ask us the funding, some people think it's the government, some people think it's education. I still think fundamentally that we haven't done a good job of defining the problem. And so for me, being one of the exceptions, especially as a black founder in tech who's done fairly well, I think that what happens in this industry is that we look at the models of success and we tell the other people who don't have that yet that that's what they should do instead of trying to fix the whole system to make every, lift everyone up, we, still, we point to people like myself and say, I see meritocracy exists. Right. Instead of actually saying, actually, don't use Joa as a reason to continue not investing in black and brown founders. Use Joa as evidence that we should invest more in black and brown founders. So and I that think, that's, the, that's the way out of the I forest. think that right. it's just we need to define the problem, and, and, right. and part of the problem is around, we're in an industry where meritocracy is a, is a myth that is told and preached as gospel. Right. But it's hard enough to be successful as a startup founder adding, you know, black or brown on top of it. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but to your point yeah. about, yeah. you know, is time going to solve this? I'm, uh, I'm sort of optimistic about this because when you look at the trends of the younger generation and the expectations they have of the brands that they're buying from and things like that, you know, we're seeing that they expect more um, impact level returns. They want to see brands participating in society. And I think when we talk about diversity, it's moved from this sort of quota check the box mm-hmm. to now what we're talking about it is diversity and inclusion, and the and the now we're talking about is diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And so I think we are seeing a progression of it's not simil- it's not just about assimilation; it's about actual value driven beliefs right, right. that different perspectives create better businesses. I'm interested in, in Eugene's use of the word culture in this respect. The statistics mm. are interesting, but they really don't tell the story. Right. Ha- having Being able to check a box, as you say, mm-hmm. is not enough. There's got to be a commitment on the part of, a, of the industry or of individual companies to lean into yeah. the values piece of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So, so you're a di- director of diversity and inclusion. What does that mean exactly? What, uh, ha- what, what does that job requirement or job description mean in terms of how you attempt to, to come at this problem? Well, for Capital Factory, you know, being a co-founder, I've been there since the beginning, and our director structure is just fundamentally different with their non-compensated roles and their people that are driven by the passion that, right. that, they're, uh, that they're working in. So I'm really passionate about increasing diversity and inclusion in tech, and that was a direction that I could provide some leadership and some overarching uh, input into you know, asking the operational team, can we dedicate resources, including money, uh, to increase diversity in tech. So the first thing we did is we went out and we said, all right, we're going we're gonna to put funding, we're going to put our $100,000 challenge towards the, at the time, four categories that we had put out, which was black, Latinx, um, LGBT, and women. And we actually ran programming specific to serving those markets, and we um, invested in companies. And so hopefully by breaking down the investment barrier and provide, by providing content for that community that's guided by that community, we're creating a more inclusive ecosystem. Right. So that's the sort of my role is to shape that. And then, you know, the typical operational team delivers on it. We have the events team and the partnerships team and the programming team right. that put it all together. The point is that it's an intentional effort. It's not yep. something that happens yeah. actually. With dedicated but resources. You have to yourself to. Um, uh, Eugene, on the entrepreneur, you know, is there, I, I want to ask you, is there a difference on the startup founder entrepreneur side and on the workforce side? Is, do we have a different conversation to have about diversity higher up the food chain versus further down the food chain? You know, this reminds me, it reminds me, some mutual friends of ours, we had done a survey of all the entrepreneurs, in, the social entrepreneurs in Austin. 
And they came back, and every single person on that list was white. And I said, how could this possibly be? Right. I said, poor people are the most socially entrepreneurial people in the world. You know, they, they launch little startups on the corners. They have all these little businesses. And, and it's just not being very inclusive in how you define entrepreneurship. Um, so so we, we have a lot of entrepreneurs um, in lifestyle businesses, in businesses that just allow them to send their kids to school and, and, and keep food on the table. Mm -hmm. The moving them up aspirationally, when, when I think when, when people see that you have greater access to capital, that you have greater access to different business models, will I think allow people to expand their, their yeah. ambitions. Um, in the and, work, you, and, you, and you've been a technology banker. You've actually been somebody yeah. on, the, on the side of the conversation where you make capital available to people who have ideas. To well, and that and helping Margo get people fund off the, off the ground. So the, right. first Austin, the first CDC in Texas um, that particularly did a lot of investment in East Austin when, when people didn't cross the highway. Right. Uh, Joey, you're all Texans. Uh, or, you know, I mean, Melly is a transplant, but Melly's <laughs> been here for a long time. <laughs> Right. I mean, you know, born and you're, raised. You're born and raised. You're, you're born. Is there something specific about Texas? Texas is a very diverse state and getting more diverse. It ought to be easier here. We're not having a diversity and technology conversation in Vermont. Mm -hmm. We're having one in Texas. Yeah. You should have one in Vermont. Yeah, we should probably have well, one in Vermont. Probably should. <laughs> but, but we're not. We're having yeah. one here. Yeah. Uh, th this should be an environment where, given the diversity of the population, mm -hmm. in theory, this should yeah. be a little bit of an easier nut to crack, shouldn't it? So. so Here's what I think is Texas has this convergence of two styles of business. Yeah. I think in technology, which you know Silicon Valley is a big factor in that, you have this this meritocracy style, which is you know the kind of survival of the fittest, and you know so be it. And um, the Texas business mentality, I think, is you know limited government interaction um, and. You, it's a little bit more open. And I think that in, in a good case scenario, those two things would be like a one plus one equals three. Um, in some cases, you see that. But I honestly think systematically, when you merge this merit, myth of meritocracy with this open business platform that we have here in Texas, you lack the one ingredient that we just talked about here, which is intentionality. So you have an investment community and a government infrastructure of which diversity and inclusion is not a part of the intentionality in how they create a framework that is more diverse and inclusive for right. entrepreneurs. And so I think that you're going to need either the private markets, investors, or the public markets, government, to have a little bit more intentionality with how they try to create the outcomes they want. Or maybe this is the outcome they want. Start with a goal in mind, have a plan, execute on that plan. Being yes. left alone is both right a, now we have a lot a of reactive. Thing and a terrible thing. There's right. a lot of reactive behavior. Right. Um, not a lot of intentionality, and yeah. I think you know we need to put a little bit more intentionality right. into the ecosystem. Eugene, this is really the question, isn't it? Is the problem that the tech industry has with diversity a problem that is the tech industry's responsibility and fault, for lack of a better word, or is Texas, Austin, the problem? Is the tech industry the problem, or is Texas the problem? Are we the problem? You know, I, I think this, the state, because of education and cumulative discrimination, has more of the problem. Right. The tech industry owns some of the problem. Yeah. I mean, how many of us have not yet even adopted blind resume practices? Right. I and mean, we know that we're going to increase the hiring or the interviewing of women and minorities by 5 to 25%. Right. If we just make the resumes blind. How, how persistent is, or blind, just to pick that one example, how yeah. persistent is the practice of looking at resumes blind in, in the industry? No, the very uh, few. In tech is an industry where, if anything, when you start a company, when you start a company, you start with your friends. You start yeah. with people you know, reputations that you have been right. established. It's the opposite of blind. So you're, right. you're, you're, you're not doing, I mean, you're lucky if in the first 50 employees you get to the point where people are, getting to people that they've never met, never interacted, and no one that they've hired already knows. Some, so I, I, that's one of the, the, the issues is that one of the things that fosters technology growth is feeling like you're building this kind of like passionate team where people want to work on the same problem together. And so that makes people want to work with their friends. People they know, people yeah. that look like them. And at the same time, that's the very thing that creates this cumulative effect of more kind of segregation. Yeah. And it's not, it's not just that. I mean, look, I'm, I'm on the 
Executive Committee of the Board of Visitors of McDonald Observatory. Number one, I'm one of the youngest people on there, which is a big problem. And two, you know, yeah, I'm, you're not I'm, exactly. I, yeah, I exactly. Say this to you, you're not exactly a kid. It, right. Exactly. <laughs> and and there are. I mean, I might be the only queer on there, but but then there's, um, you know, we look around the room and. It's not intentional. People invite their friends. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and so we did, you know, we went and bought a group that had black and brown people in their tech program. Right. It bought them out of their existing lease and brought them to Capital Factory so that there would be some more black and brown people. Yeah. Just makes a huge difference. Yeah. You start looking out, I mean, that way when you look around the room, this is the most diverse audience in Austin that you know, you'll find. Right. But again, I come back to the fact that this is a, it's d diverse in a lot of ways, but it's also a younger audience in the main, and the younger population of Texas is more good diverse point. than the Very. older population. Very good Very. Point. And how many of you have college degrees? Right? It's a highly educated yeah. demographic. Right. And this I mean, city is. Well, and it, it, Austin is atypical in many ways, but I think Austin, like every place else, is experiencing something like an overturning of the mulch demographically, where the next generation that's now coming up, the future leaders of the state, the future employees, employers of the state, are going to be, by definition, more diverse than, than, and, than yeah. our generation. And, and, you know, when we talk about this issue, yeah. though, you're dealing with people who work very actively in the startup community, which by volume is not the biggest offender. Yeah. And so, you know, when you look at diversity in tech, the numbers that we're citing are often functions of these, this demographic in leadership and this demographic progressing in, you know, the echelons of the tech sector. So you mean there's a, a distinction between startup, the startup sector and the tech sector Absolutely. In, in the main? And to yeah. your question about right. is it a state or is it a tech sector question, yeah. At the scale level, it's absolutely a state question. You know, we started Texas Competes. Eugene and I were the early co-founders of Texas Competes with some folks for that very issue, which is that we had legislation that was threatening the competitive nature of Texas to outside companies coming in and wanting to see economic development was a function of it, it again. having discriminatory, discriminatory right. policies. But, but, but big tech, you think, separate and apart from Texas, has stuff to answer for itself still. In well, and, it, and as we all know, it needs to show up in politics, right? right? Tech is not a sector that's used to the process of politics and the uh, mm -hmm. interface. And so yeah. part of what, right. what I spent the last couple of years doing was making an effort to raise the visibility of CEOs that they can walk into the Capitol and talk to representatives right. and let them know that the sector expects better legislation. Get, getting tech to engage on policy because the decisions made at the Capitol or not at the Capitol, but around politics right. yeah. ultimately affect the ability of tech to do the stuff that it Look, does. Look, and, and it, it wasn't easy two years ago when we were trying to start, was it just two years no, ago? No, 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 two years four ago four years we ago walked for the CEOs around. Texas yeah. competes, but, but there, was, there was a major Texas corp, or corporation that's really powerful up the, the hill, but they were, they were scared of the lieutenant governor. The lieutenant governor had let people know, do not come up here you know, if you want to remain right. in favor. Yeah. And I had given this multinational corporation back in 1992, a national award on behalf of the human rights campaign. And I called them up and said, I'm about to have a big press conference where I take your award away. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, it, it, I couldn't really do it, but I was going to do it. You know, and that, that <laughs> made them, I mean, because they were scared. They right. didn't want to put their brand at risk up, you know, up the street. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they've, they've, all, they've almost all stepped up. So let me, let me come to the, the current political climate in Texas and some of the legislation you're talking about. Let me first pick up, Melly, Eugene's point earlier about the education system. So public ed, higher ed, producing the kinds of graduates, pr pr providing the kinds of skills training that ultimately feeds in as a pipeline, that was your word, into the technology sector. We need to do better at that. that that's your wow. expectation. We do need to do better. I hesitate... Uh to call it a pipeline issue because there are many, many, many qualified candidates who are overlooked by the practices of HR and hiring, and there it needs to be more pipeline development. They're not mutually exclusive, and I think yeah. the tendency is, you know, companies that don't necessarily have the practices in place are like, oh, we can't find them, and, right. you know, and the reality is uh, we need pipeline development in tech, generally speaking. Right. We have an underemployment problem. Yeah. So. And, and it also can't be the case, Joa, that, that tech waits for good qualified graduates to come to them. They have to be more, uh, speaking of intentionality, mm -hmm. they have to be more uh, intentional about going onto campus and plucking out the best. Yeah. I was interested to see a couple of years ago, Dell talk about going onto the campuses of historically black colleges, mm -hmm. for instance, 
to improve training in the tech pipeline. Mm -hmm. That's now become something that Dell, and Dell is not alone in doing that. But it's really a question of having to go on to campus and be much more aggressive in trying to recruit the best candidates well, it's, to I mean, attack this problem. Being, again, being more intentional, right. doing the things, finding the people where they are is, 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 is a big part of what needs to happen. But I also go back to the fact that when you think about these big, especially the big tech companies, they are over-indexed on how much they rely on women and people of color for their businesses, for the bottom lines of their companies. Yeah. Um, so talk, talk about that. What do so you mean by that? A let's look at Twitter, for example. So Twitter is a, is a company where without movements like Black Lives Matter or Oscar So White or Me Too and these things that happen in large part on Twitter. Movements. These companies would not make their quarters. The, literally, their earnings would go down if not for people using these platforms. So, Sale of iPhones. So, yeah, so, so what, I, what I don't understand a lot of times with some of the big tech companies is that people like us are good enough to be the users of their products but not the people who create the products. And, and so there seems to be a disconnect between how much intentionality and intellect needs to go into using the product versus making it. And that's where I think that the, the, the problem is. It's, yes, going to historical black colleges and these things is gonna be helpful, but I also would just say, hey, look at who is using your products and f find those people where they are and put them in position to become, to get on the other end of the product, to like create the product. So does someone need to have an engineering degree from Stanford? to use Twitter? No. So why would you have that as an imperative for someone creating the product that the person that doesn't have a degree uses? Right, yeah. And you know, there's statistics that show, I mean, I think it's 58% of venture capitalists are white males. Right. So 58% of the users of these products aren't white males. So I think that there's this line that someone can create between the products and the funding behind the products and then the people who use the products. And that line should be there should be much more connectivity between that line. Right now, you're seeing all this, this disjointed right. behavior. And so, again, I think it goes back to intentionality and looking at the data. If you have the data about your user base, then you should give that same data to your recruitment teams, to your HR department, yeah. and say, this is what we're, this is, these are the targets. The target isn't, oh, 14% of the US population is this. The target is 18% of our users are this. So that's the real target, not this low number, but it's the with who's actually using our product. Right. I was amazed, Eugene, I, I mentioned this to somebody before we came out here today. The Statesman did an analysis of 11 major Austin tech firms. Now, these are national brands, but with a significant presence in Austin, and they looked at the gender breakdown specifically okay. of their workforce. There was only one of the 11 major tech companies in Austin, and it was Expedia, mm -hmm. that had a majority of its employees were women. Mm -hmm. Expedia is home away. It's home away. It's, it's, well, it's now, now, now Verbo. Right. But it's, <laughs> so it's not, yeah, exa exactly. That's the but, so, but the majority, the only one of 11 where a majority of the, of the workforce was female was Expedia. Whose founders were quite intentional about doing that. Very specific right. about that. Only one had a majority female workforce. Only one other had above 40%, and that was Samsung. Mm -hmm. Three had below 30%, including Dell Technologies. Mm -hmm. And AMD actually was below 25%. Now, I don't know what the percentage breakdown is of the customer base for these businesses, but I feel confident that it's not nearly as, as abysmal mm -hmm. from a gender standpoint as that, to Joe's point, mm -hmm. right? The, the it, workforce doesn't reflect the customer base even remotely. It, it doesn't happen without intentionality. Yeah. I mean, what happens without, without um, duplicity or without malintent yeah. is that you hire those around you, is what you're saying. Right, yeah. And, and um, you know, it... it people, uh, women aren't always feel welcome. Uh, women and people in minorities aren't always welcome in certain organizations. So I'm not sure that they go there to apply. Yeah, we've got there's got to be outreach. Yeah, they don't feel welcome because they're not always. They welcome. haven't been <laughs> historically. I mean, you yeah, know. right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Melly, this point that Eugene made about startup capital, Joe also alluded to this. Who's getting the the money? Three percent of venture capital backed startups are led by women. Three percent. The best three. The best. <laughs> but, it's, it, but it's kind of amazing in 2019 to hear that. 3% of venture-backed startups? Are run by women or founded by venture women? Venture capital-backed startups are led by women. 3%. 1% are led by African Americans. Now, if you do startups generally, venture-funded or not, the numbers led by women go up to 17%. But yeah. 
it, it's, it, flat, it's been there at the same number for about a year. Right. It, over be, 10 it, years it begins too. with access to capital and the ability. I mean, you can be intentional about it. If you start a business, as you say, you tend to populate that business with people who look like you, who, who know mm -hmm. you. If you're only backing men, mm -hmm. then you're contributing to the problem. You're not solving the problem. It's true. What are we going to do about it? Well, <laughs> well what, what, what about the, the fact that the most, the, the venture back company in Austin with has the highest buzz? Is maybe one of the highest valuations is not only run by a woman, but the executive team is predominantly yeah. women. And w, that is WPN. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Extraordinary company doing quite a bit of intentional leadership and sharing best practices right. with the sector. Right. Uh, and I think that's how we change the game, right? We, we put some wins on the board and we sing their praises. Yeah. And, and we, it, we demonstrate by action that these companies are uh, not only viable, but thriving. Don't you make the argument, though, Eugene, Joa, that this is not simply for diversity for the sake of diversity, but diversity actually contributes to the success oh, of well, businesses? It's, it's, when you said that Expedia, HomeAway, now Verbo, right. is the only company with over 50% of their workforce are women, I was not surprised. And the reason why is because it's a travel company. Right. Travel is a behavior that all of us want to do. Right. So it's highly likely to reflect the behavior. And so... So I'm in, the, I'm in the travel business. I have a travel company. Right. And so 85% you know, of the users of my company's product are women or people of color. Of the users. Um, and so I think that really what needs to happen is people should, again, go back to who is using this product and who do we want to use this product and what are the behaviors that we're trying to encourage and that same mentality should go into, there's a lot of science that goes into creating use cases and creating go-to-market strategies to reach certain people. Businesses need the same processes for recruitment. You should have a go-to-market strategy for recruiting your employees that allows you to have the kind of diverse use cases and, and customer bases that exist for your product. Um, so I really think, I'm not surprised that it's travel, and then I'm also not surprised that it's a semiconductor company that was the one, one of the ones right. that were below 20%. Right. Um, so that just makes the job harder. For a semiconductor company, yes, perhaps it is harder for them to get to the 50% than a travel company. Predominantly but, all engineers. Yeah, but, but, yeah. but ultimately what that comes down to is we can't let these companies off the hook that have use cases that are clearly indexed for everyone. You know, travel is for everyone. So if your workforce doesn't reflect the use case of travel being for everyone, then you're probably not going to have the best product. So for us, we've, we've been able to carve out a, a niche for ourselves because, again, 85% of our, our users are people of color or women. And all of travel companies, the majority of them are founded by white males. And so if you are a woman or if you're a person of color and you're looking at maybe their executive team page or their board of directors, you're not seeing people of color and women. And so you're maybe not as likely to embrace that company as a potential place for you. Yeah. Um, so a part of this is that, you know, it it's, it's needs to start small with, um, you know, saying we are making it. I mean, I see, there are a lot of companies lately that have been starting to say we're going to have one woman on our board or one person of color on our board. And so they kind of start with tokenism, and that's like the, putting the toe in. Um, but I think it has to go beyond that to say, we're not going to stop at one. We're going to keep going. I think right now we have a lot of companies that are like, once they hit the number, they're like, oh, we mission accomplished. Right. Let's, let's, let's just stay out of the headlines and keep it moving. So yeah. I think it really needs to reflect the industry. Before we leave there and go to the question, when, just dice and slice what we mean by diversity in, in the workforce real quick um, and, and the data that is saying that it really contributes to the bottom line. There's especially information that says um, from McKinsey, from Deloitte, and from yep. many other sources that said having women in the boardroom increases your organization's yep. success and performance. 21% more likely to experience now, a, a profitability with gender there, as a part the, of leadership. The, there's a nuance to that. Yep. One is it can't just be one or two because they then don't have the voice to speak up yep. in those meetings. Yep. Um, but even more than that is it's got to be a diversity of of experience, and particularly problem-solving experience. So there's a professor at Northwestern who, who broke this down. And, and you know, if everybody went to HBS and, or to McCombs and took the same class, it doesn't matter that you're black, white, brown, boy, or girl, um, you're not going to give the diversity of problem-solving and experience that people from different schools 
in different right. backgrounds. So together. part of the problem is getting out of the groupthink mode. Yeah. Actually, uh, <laughs> I think this panel is a great example. I think women listen better. <laughs> you think what? <laughs> They're talking too much? No, I think listening is a, is a, is a fundamental um, leadership value that enables better product development, better employee satisfaction, retention, happiness. And I think women listen really well. And so I do think, that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of joking, but there's a, there's a behavioral difference there that I think engenders a, um, a cultural component and also a relationship. Businesses are built on relationships first and foremost, right? Yeah. Customers sign contracts because they have a relationship either with their account manager or with the brand or something. And part of having a relationship is listening well. And so I think that that's just a really simple thing that we can do is lift up that as a core value inside companies and also help men develop that skill set. We spend a lot of time helping women develop the firm handshake, <laughs> right? And, and the and the man spreading. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> we, we talk a lot about how women can take up space more and do that, but we also need to do the other side, which is we need to help men understand what are the attributes of the gender differences that make companies stronger and how can we lift each other up in Empathy. those. Yeah. I don't want every man on my team to, to let go of those masculine tendencies that push the edge and do the, right? Those are all valuable things. It's, a, it's an ecosystem play, and just like, I'm a biologist, so I always go back to that, what makes these companies stronger and why the returns are better is because it's an ecosystem of perspectives that when balanced and when truly respected, creates a better result, yeah. right? So we, we spend time talking about what the problem is, defining the problem, talking about various aspects of it. I want to try to get to, in the 10 or so minutes that we have together before we bring the audience in, a, a theory of, of where we go with this, mm -hmm. what happens next. There is this diversity pledge that has been in circulation. Mm -hmm. that I know Capital Factory is uh, one of the many institutions that has uh, supported it. The theory here is that diversity inclusion is better for business. It, includes, it increases investment returns, lowers volatility and stock performance. Mm -hmm. It's basically selling the virtues and the values of diversity in terms of businesses being more successful. And there are components of this pledge that I think are interesting strategies that the technology sector is embracing, at least those who've signed on to this pledge. There's a commitment to interviewing candidates of color, kind of mm -hmm. similar to the old NFL Rooney rule. Mm -hmm. We're going to be right. sure that we interview candidates and have finalists who are candidates of color to yeah. build a pipeline, not just when we have jobs open, but also when we don't. There's a um, diversity transparency, self-reporting of diversity. Basically, make yourself own the environment in which you operate. There's a commitment to inclusive work, workforce and workplace culture stuff. Much of the stuff that you've done such a great job at a culturati and helping to model and understanding what works and policies that are appropriate to, to encouraging a diverse uh, workforce. Pay equity is another thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then unconscious bias training to be sure that all employees at a business mm -hmm. understand the right page to, yeah. to be on. Th these all seem like elemental strategies. Nothing controversial about these strategies, but to see them all taken together, you kind of begin to see a theory of the case going forward. Absolutely, and they're, they're hard to do at scale. Um, you know, there's been a number of pledges, and I think pledges are important because they do, they do demonstrate intentionality. It's a, it's a public articulation of your values, right? But the accountability factor there yeah. is, has not been that strong in pledges, and, and it enables people, the tokenism that, you know, people have around, I raised my hand and I said yes, but the follow-through, it's very difficult to track and manage. Yeah. Uh, Steven Strauss, who started the most recent diversity pledge, is a white recovering venture capitalist. And I think that, you know, I sing his praises for the fact that he's going to his community and saying, hey, you know, we, we have the power to um, influence change. Let's step up and do it. I think that's a, a really valuable and um, admirable thing that he's done to stick his neck out with his uh, white brotherhood of, of venture capitalists and ask them to step up. And so I think everyone has influence in their independent areas that can drive these pledges to actual accountability in a way that, that shapes it. But at the end of the day, it's the scale that's difficult. And one of the things that WP Engine has done that I just think is so fantastic is they've open sourced some of the lessons learned and they've made them available because it's really hard to do these things at scale. And so as we roll these things out, companies that are willing to step up and show some leadership and share that with the rest of the community. It's really expensive to develop 
the legal side of this for a startup. So you might have all the intention in the world, but you don't have the twenty-five, thirty, fifty thousand dollars to develop the policies and procedures. So um, some toolkits around that that would help the scale with it, I think, would be fantastic. What, what do you? What can you say about what Heather Brunner and WP Engine has has is, is teaching everybody else about this? Um, I'll say one thing. Since but I, when I want to go back to Steve Strauss one one second, which is he's got a gay kid and he's got a kid that, with dyslexia, and so there's a wokeness that happens when. You know, all of a sudden, one of your children or two of your children have issues. And isn't that how most of us normally move? Right. Because something in our orbit shakes us up. Uh, yeah. One of the most important things that WP Engine is doing as relates to, to this audience and this topic is, is hiring non-college grads. So from the workforce, and it, it's, it's both good to do and it's necessary, or else they would have had to open an office elsewhere because the labor market is so tight in Austin. But they're, they're doing you know, very rigorous testing for non, rigorous testing for anybody to come in, but for non-college grads to join the workforce, and then a humongous investment in, in training and development. Mm -hmm. And what they're finding are extraordinarily loyal, competent, and ambitious new employees. Right. Who, so they come in with customer service jobs, and very quickly are moving in. They're growing their the own, basically. One of yeah. the ways to combat sure. this problem is to grow your own. Absolutely. And, right. and lots of, as Melly says, lots of uh, cutting edge business practices, particularly focused on the internal customer or the employees. And it, it isn't coincidental that most of these broke when executive staff was five of the six executive officers were, were women. Mm -hmm. And now I think we're kind of like four and three, but right. still predominantly women. But there, there's, you know, it, it, it's just about getting outside of the box. Yeah. So, um, Joe, on the yeah. accountability question, I love yeah. the idea of self-reporting diversity statistics. You have to own your shit. Yeah, but there's no stick there. There's no, right? <laughs> right. But, but once you self-report, that's not the end of the conversation. It's got to be the beginning of the conversation, right? Yeah, and I actually, Capital Factory is an investor in my company. Um, but I, I think that Capital Factory, one of the best things I think that they do in the, at least in the Austin ecosystem, is that they do have a model that the, the nature, the very nature of their model in which they have these directorship roles where they're kind of volunteer based, um, it, I think it makes it to where they're not looking for success bias to kind of keep what they're doing going as a business. And I think that's one of the issues with the tech ecosystem at large is that you know, you're looking for success and you're just looking to repeat that success over and over and over and you kind of mm -hmm. stop running experiments. Yeah. So if you invest in five companies and four of them are white males and the fifth one doesn't do well and it wasn't a white male, then you're just gonna keep investing in white males. And I think what Capital Factory has, has, has done and in, in, in model is that with their investments, with their events, with their, what they've created is they're looking for new things, so they're, they're always unveiling new initiatives, and I think that that's really important. I think that's one of the luxuries that big tech does have. They have plenty of capital. They're not hurting for money, um, so I think that they should be running experiments. It, it, none of us know the answer to how Apple Computer or Google or any of these companies can get to the, the types of diversity and inclusion they need to have at scale, but we do know that they have plenty of capital to run a lot of experiments, so I think Unveiling the data is a big part of accountability. But I, I think the follow-up piece isn't necessarily that you have the answer, but that you keep trying to find it. Right. And I think what happens is a lot of these companies, right. they hire a head of diversity and inclusion, and they think that's the answer. And, and then see, not, you, at the, and see you at the Christmas party. Right? Or, they get their, or, or, yeah, or they get their token right. executive or board member, and they're like, I answered it. And they're just constantly looking for these silver bullet answers instead of continuing running right. experiments to make so, so that so, so let me ask each of you before we go to the group here. If there's one thing that you could do, one piece, puzzle piece you could move, or game piece you could move to advance this conversation, wave your wand, what would it be? Venture capital. I would, I would significantly um, require, I think the government could do this. I think the government could put in certain types of mechanisms with the venture capital industry, not to control where they invest in right. areas, but to put in incentives. It could be tax-based incentives around capital gains, for venture capital firms that invest in more diverse and inclusive founders and companies. 
I think that there are a lot of benefits that could pass on it, it all, through it the all capital begins, gains that they re yeah. receive. It all begins with that. Eugene, what do you think? What would be the one most impactful thing that you could do? Find a way to publicly expand um, who's included within the definition of entrepreneurship so that when we're looking around that we see our uncle and aunts and people in our block are entrepreneurial and then give greater visibility to the building blocks to be more successful as an entrepreneur. Yeah, Mally? You know, I th I'm such a systems thinker that um, it's hard for me to imagine a wave the wand scenario, but we measure everything in business fiscally, and I think some sort of culture index, there you go, you heard it here first, <laughs> some sort of culture index where we're, we're raising the stories of those that are making the investments and we're helping those companies be successful. Um, and that they're not the exception to the rule, that you know, as a culture, as a community, as consumers, we're lifting them up. And um, Instead of the HRC index, we start a culture index? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't love the shaming indexes, right. right? So it can't be a shaming index. It needs to be but a... But call out, call out success and success, tell the best practices, right? of the best. Right. This is one of those areas where I think that things like crypto and blockchain are gonna be helpful because I don't think companies know how to value this work and how important it is yet, uh, or they don't want to figure out dollars, but I think that things like technology like blockchain could potentially introduce indexes where there's some value attached to it. Like a, there's S&P 500, there could be like a DNI 500, where stocks or prices Diver diversity are moving up and down, right? yeah. and there's some, yeah. block, there's some crypto asset or something attached to that behavior. So, oh, you just hired two executives and they're both women, your value went up. And it's not just on your stock price, but it's on how much externally people value your company. So I think that there could be some, some ways where this stuff could happen. And I don't, I don't mean to be cheeky about this, but I also think we need to do some education uh, in the political sphere around the value of this, right? Um, because that world is moved by voters. Yeah. Voters are moved by businesses and jobs. And so if we can help bridge the gap of understanding that businesses with more diversity actually do better, we can mm -hmm. start to make this not so much of a partisan issue, but an economic issue. The, uh, the, the fact is, Eugene, businesses have voters, and those voters are customers. Absolutely. And, if, and, and customers can choose to associate with businesses that, that, that practice what they preach on diversity and inclusion, or they cannot. This, this, is, this is getting monetized in the marketplace today. I mean, you're, you're hearing from you know, the largest investor in the world, Larry Fink with Globe, uh, um, BlackRock, BlackRock. Um, who's saying, I'm not investing in you guys if you guys don't start taking responsibility for society. Right. And, and articulate what, where you're moving the needle. And you know, you've got Edelman saying that 76% of investors are now assessing whether companies are doing a good job at that. And diversity and inclusion and impacting the community positively is, is front and center. It's a determinant of your ability to succeed as a business. All right, let's take questions for the last few minutes. Gentlemen in the back and then over here. Sir. Great. <laughs> Outside voice is good. Yeah. Right. So inver invert this. We think that diversity is a value for technology, but how do we? What's the value of technology for diversity? Well, again, I go back to the use case. Yeah. When you have one type of customer, then you're only going to get so much of a use case in the customer base. And I think that diversity literally feeds technology different types of use cases. It says these are different people, these are different people with their different right. life experiences. It, so again, going back to Twitter, Twitter has so many use cases now that people of color and women have created for that business. When they started, it was not about creating movements, but social movements that usually required people to get together in a, mo in a room <coughs> now are happening virtually. And so I think that these businesses need to start valuing the, the, how the variety of use cases that they're getting as results of people of color and women, and, and as a result of that, it, they should be trying to foster that behavior more by getting those people onto their team. So I, 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 think t I don't think social media as an industry would even be as what it is today without diversity and inclusion. Eugene, can, tech, can tech, technology platforms advance the cause of diverse communities, propel and diverse communities into a conversation where that then they're in a, in a leadership role. I mean, I, th I think that we... Absolutely. Right? Yeah, uh, we see that. Pe do people know um, Pete Seeger? Pete Seeger was uh, 
folk singer who who was maybe you, Melly, and me, maybe the one. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. but you know who was the least tech person in the world. His granddaughter, who we know well, um, he said, you know, I don't really get. He's now died, but he says I don't really get social media, but I suspect it's going to help women become equals. And he had that in, insight. You know it. It, because it allows our voices, you know, we no longer need, act, we need, no longer have to go through the gatekeeper to get right. our voices out there. I, I, I think that's how it's going to change. I think that is true, and I think we are also experiencing the echo chamber aspect of social media, mm -hmm. where we're driving, we're driving our special interest groups into communities and siloing them. And I think it's the breaking down of the silos that's going to change this game. Uh, I think we're quite frankly seeing that politically, like. It, there is a divide and conquer mm -hmm. um, side effect that comes with technology. The downside to the upside. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, and then there, but there's also the, you know, how it used to cost us $5 million to start a business. Now because of everything, all the yeah. technology, I mean, we can get a business started for $5,000. That may be the best yeah. answer actually so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that answer. Good. Hi. problem in diversity in tech. And we hear that a lot, but then we see things like y'all are mentioning the grow your own ideas and people who have skills that are often overlooked and that there are other ways other than a CS degree to be to get into tech. And then we have facts like the fact that black and Latinx um, CS graduates are hired at half the rate that they graduate from these CS programs. So my question for you all is what can we do to redefine the pipeline and retire the idea that college CS degrees are somehow the only way to get competent employees in tech? Well, this was the I think, a point you made, Millie, mm -hmm. that we have to stop thinking that a college degree is a prerequisite for this kind of work, right? Well, I'm, I'm really pro-education because regardless of the specifics of the degree, I think the training that comes with the, the discipline, the communication, the writing skills, et cetera, are really core to generalized success. So I don't, I don't want to say that that's not valuable, but I do think that um, we, you know, we, there are ways in which we value that more than we value experience, right? I mean, I, I experience that every day. I went back and got my master's um, at, a, I'm not going to tell you what age, but I'll just say, not, not the typical Th age. 30. <laughs> and, um, and that's because it is an important pro part of the process, both for being a teacher as well as for being, you know, a, a leader. And so we shouldn't, I don't think we should lower the bar simply to accommodate this. I think we should empower others to have access to education and access to the skills training. If it's not an actual bachelor's degree, then it's skills training. And that's where I commend the work of the ACC community and like, how do we get more of that? How do we do skills retraining in populations of people where, you know, they've got basic computer skills, but they're not ready for the AI and the machine learning and the NLP world. We can do skills training on that. So there's other alternatives to educate to traditional education that I think are equally viable. But, but I don't want to let ourselves off on the culpability of this. And by ourselves, I mean particularly black and brown people. You know, only 14% of Hispanics in Texas are getting bachelor's degrees. 23% of African Americans. Look, in, in Texas, the white community is only doing 34%. So, nothing, I mean, in write, Texas, nothing to write home about, but relatively yeah, speaking, significantly but, better. You know, there, there are, um, you know, in, in, in Texas, only 25% of Hispanics are getting, are graduating college. You know, we have, it, it is, um, part of the problem is that my community, the Hispanic community, isn't holding ourselves to the same standards of achievement um, that are necessary to be successful in today's economy. Yeah. Hi. Hi. My question has to do uh, with something that you mentioned early on, Millie, uh, about um, hiring managers and HR and being a gatekeeper. And then also to Eugene, you mentioned blind resumes. What is the part that technology can play in assisting hiring managers in becoming more blind, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that, I do think, is the solution. HR is often not the gatekeeper. They are being told, don't show me these resumes. 
So how do we go about doing that in a way that I think technology can help? There, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of technologies. I mean, we can just go through through Indeed um, and get the information in blind. So it is. Um, look, a, HR in the startup world is underfunded until you're, you know, it doesn't exist <laughs> until you're like C, Series C, where you can afford to really bring in bring in somebody that has some some experience. Um, or you can hire a consultant. <laughs> True. If we had, if we had that, you know, the monies. But right. yeah, we're we're under an inv we're under invest in, in solving that problem. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hey guys, thanks for being here. Um, just a couple points that I felt like I had to say before I went into my question. Um, having a child who's gay doesn't really mean that they have an issue, just the first one, because that was kind of unclear. And then the second one was that because the company has engineers doesn't mean they have to be male engineers or white. So just throwing that out there. But um, we talked a lot about diversity, and that's all about a numbers game, right? But in order to keep that diverse talent, really inclusion best practices are very necessary and integral. So can you talk about best practices in terms of inclusion that you've seen or that you think others could implement? Best practices at, at specific... At, at, you want to call out a particular company or something that you've experienced yourself or been responsible for yourself. That or how you think things could improve in yeah. terms of inclusion because diversity is the first necessary step, but yep. it can't be alone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a big company, so I can't, I'm, I, I'm not like a big tech company. Um, but what I would say is I have been in a situation where, um, you know, when I, when I worked at a tech company before I started Localer, I was the only black person at a director or above role for some time. And the thing that I remember in that scenario was that I was representing my entire race, <laughs> you know? So I think one of the main things that, that anyone can do, let's assume that you're in an organization, big or small, that the numbers are not strong. Right. So you don't have diversity. Um, and then they, they attain diversity. So they have the right number of black or brown managers, executives, et cetera. Um, I think one of the biggest things that needs to happen is, and I think you mentioned this, training could possibly help this, but I also just think it's an executive level thing um, where CEOs and executives really need to train and model the behavior to their employees that makes those employees that, that are the diverse employees not feel like they have to represent their entire race. And so one of the main ways you can create inclusion is simply by not allowing diversity to just be diversity. Like, I didn't want to walk around at a company and just be like the black guy. I wanted to just be the director of operations, <laughs> I had my title, I had my job. And so I, I think one of the really important things is just putting people in position to answer questions that have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not they're a woman or a person of color. Um, so to, you were talking about women being great listeners. I would say the onus in that situation is on modeling that as a skill that all men need to have, like to your point, to your right? Point. So, so that would help it so that the woman in that situ situation isn't like the person that people are like, oh, you're a good listener, so I need you for this thing that women have, and then I'm, the thing that I don't need from you, I'm not, you know, so I think that that's one of the big things. Like, I just remember walking in my office and people looking at my shoes, you know, as like, or people asking me what I was, yeah, or people <laughs> asking me what music I was listening to, so they were kind of, over, they were over-indexing on these, like, cultural values that I brought, and I really, um, I, I find that it's just a way more effective if the CEO or the leaders in that organization can go to those people and, and rely on them for things beyond what their the skin right. color is or their ethnicity or gender. Uh, I'd like to, uh, we, we called out HomeAway earlier, and I do think that because of the founders um, who have been incredible in our community for, for decades now, um, they had a foundation. But now the leadership that's come in place, uh, Capital Factory works a lot with HomeAway on our diversity and inclusion initiatives. They're a sponsor of them. Tina Wand, who um, manages the product team, has said, hey, you know what? We don't know how, we're a bunch of white women we don't, in leadership. We don't know how to do this. We're going to let the groups, you know, create themselves, decide what they want to do, and commit funding to them. So I think a core fundamental thing that every company can do is provide dedicated resources and let those groups 
help guide you about what to do. Um, and they're doing a great job at scale. That's also something that we, you know, mm -hmm. we took from the playbook at Capital Factory. And I think that that help, helps foster meaningful, uh, it helps foster trust, which is fundamentally, you know, what builds inclusion and a sense of belonging. Um, but I will say, kind of to, to Joa's point about the tokenism, you know, there is such a delicate line between creating and empowering a group and also siloing them, and you see it over and over and over again. And I've, I've actually ridden the wave of that group, yep. right? As a, as a woman, as an LGBT person, um, we need to foster, I, I, I agree we yeah. want to foster yeah. listening in men, that's not a bad mm -hmm. thing. And you know, I tell every company I meet, double down on what you're uniquely differentiated at. So I don't think we should hide the attributes. Yeah. I think we need to raise awareness and raise that conversation about genuinely increasing people's respect and value of diverse opinions, mm -hmm. right? And that's that's a society thing, right? And I think we're seeing leaders like Brene Brown who talk about shame and, right, we need to create cultures where I'm gonna step in something. I am gonna offend somebody, mm -hmm. it's guaranteed because it's part of my personality is I can be a little <laughs> crass and then I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. Right, and so creating a culture where your diversity, you're not walking on eggshells around diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, it took my business partner who was trans to walk me through Trans 101, even though I'm an LGB person, mm -hmm. I didn't understand T, and it took somebody very patient with me mm -hmm. to help me really begin to get it, right, and, mm -hmm. and, and yep. to grow personally, and without that, I would be a very different person. And so how do we create cultures where we're supporting each other, becoming better people without the shame, the culture of shame that is in social media and around this diversity and inclusion issue is like we're eating our own. It's just not healthy. The sarcasm on Twitter and the attacking. So mm -hmm. how do we increase accountability without taking it to a culture mm -hmm. of shame? I think would really um, be, be a cultural value yeah. in a company that I would like to see. Well, and here's just, I, can, I just throw yeah. one more thing in. Yeah. If, what, as a, to use this as an example, let's say if you were the CEO of Spotify, there are so many norms that you could apply to all forms of music. You could say, okay, this white guy from West Virginia, you're in charge of folk music. This black guy from Atlanta, you're in charge of rap music. You could do that, right? And make a lot of assumptions to do that. And so I think that would be diversity. And inclusion would be going to all the people and saying, what area of interest do you have? And now you're just representing this, this vertical of music. You don't have to represent that our assumption that you are interested in this music, so we need you to go do that. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's like a simple version of it. So we're, uh, we're over, we thank, you. thank you. Thank you. We're, we're over our time. We need to stop <laughs> here. For people who have questions left, let me encourage you to engage with our panelists, uh, maybe right on the way out. Um, thank you all for doing this. Thank you to our panelists for being here. Thank you, thank you for being here. Sure. Thank Thanks you. to the McComb School. We'll see you again. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.